Today we've got a nice number theory problem from the 2004 Balkan Math Olympiad. And what I like about this is we're going to solve an equation or a Diophantine equation over not just integers but primes. So our goal is to find all primes p and q such that p to the q minus q to the p equals p times q squared minus 19. And throughout this solution we're going to be using Fermat's little theorem. And so that says for all primes p and integers a, we have a to the p is congruent to a mod p. And this is maybe a slightly different or an alternative version. Sometimes you see this version that says a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p if p does not divide a, but this is equivalent. So to get started, we're going to use like what I'll call one of the truths of math contest problems dealing with primes, and that is likely the prime 2 will be somehow built into the solution. And that's because, well, 2 is the only even prime, so it plays like an important role in constructing these types of problems. So we'll start by looking for solutions that include the prime 2 and then work towards more general solutions. Okay. So let's maybe first look at the possibility of both of these being equal to 2. So in other words, p equals q equals 2. But notice that's going to collapse this left-hand side down to 0. And then this right-hand side will turn into, well, let's see, 8 minus 19 or negative 11. So that's a clear contradiction. So that means it's impossible to have p equals q equals 2. So now let's look at the next possibility, with, which is p equals 2. And then, well, q will obviously be bigger than or equal to 3. Okay, so in this case, our equation turns into 2 to the q minus q squared equals 2q squared minus 19. Okay, good. But now let's move some things around and note that we get 2 to the q plus 19 is equal to, well, let's see, 3q squared. But notice that 3q squared is most definitely a multiple of q, so it's congruent to 0 mod q. But note by Fermat's little theorem, we can very easily reduce the left-hand side mod q as well. The left-hand side will reduce to 2 plus 19, in other words, 21. So we have 21 is congruent to 0 modulo q. But notice that means that q divides 21 by the definition of congruence mod q. But that means that q equals 3 or 7. And now we have to check, well, which of those work? Well, let's try each of them. So let's try first q equals 3 and see what we get out of that. So that's going to turn into, well, let's look at this version of the equation. So we'll have, let's see, 2 to 3 minus 3 squared. Well, that's pretty clearly equal to minus 1 because it's 8 minus 9 equals, well, let's see, 2q squared. Well, that's going to be 18 minus 19. So it checks out. So in other words, p equals 2 and q equals 3 is a solution. And now let's move on to this next case, which is q equals 7, and see if we get anything out of that. Well, for that, we'll have 2 to the 7 minus 7 squared. But let's see, 2 to the 7 is 128. 7 squared is 49, so this is 128 minus 49. But let's see, is that the same thing as, well, let's see, 2 times 49 is 98 minus 19. Is that the same thing as 98 minus 19? And it is. So that means this q equals 7 is also a solution. So very quickly, we have two solutions. Now let's move on to the case when q is 2 and p is something else. Okay, so we've got our first couple of solutions. We've got p equals 2, q equals 3, or q equals 7. Now let's look at the possibility that q is equal to 2. Okay, 
So when Q is equal to two, what is that gonna turn our equation into? Well, it's gonna look something like this. We'll have P squared minus two to the P is equal to four P minus 19. But now let's move some things around and note that that gives us 19 minus 2p is equal to 4p minus p squared. But that right hand side only depending on p or being a multiple of p motivates us to reduce this thing modulo p. So this is congruent to zero mod p. But then again, using Fermat's little theorem, we know that two to the p is congruent to two mod p. So that gives us something like 17 is congruent to zero modulo p. But that means that p must divide 17, but that means that p has to be equal to 17. But now we would need to check that p equals 17 either works or does not work. So let's plug p equals 17 into this side of the equation. So we'll have 17 squared minus two to the 17. But then in order to compare these, let's notice that 17 is less than, well, what's the next power to? It's 32. So this is less than 32 squared minus two to the 17. But 32 is two to the five. So this whole thing is equal to two to the five to the two or two to the 10 minus two to the 17, but that's definitely less than zero. So we have 17 squared minus two to the 17 is less than zero. But now let's factor a two to the 10 out of this and notice that we get two to the 10 times one minus two to the seven. And so that's gonna be less than negative two to the 10. Okay. But notice that negative two to the 10 is most definitely less than well, what we get from plugging in 17 here. So I'll just write that as four times 17 minus 19 because negative two to the 10 is on the order of like negative 1000. But that's definitely less than you know, this number right here. But this inequality means that this equation cannot be satisfied, but this equation not being satisfied means that Q equals two and P equals 17 is not a solution. So, so far we only have our maybe first two solutions. Now let's move on to the case when neither P nor Q are two. So now that we've got our two solutions that involve even primes, we're gonna move on to the case when P and Q are both odd primes, meaning they're both bigger than or equal to three. So let's first reduce this whole thing modulo P and see what this turns into. So using Fermat's little theorem. So reducing this thing mod P, well, this goes to zero and then we'll have minus Q because Q to the P is congruent to Q mod P. And then over there on the right hand side, well, this will go to zero and we'll have minus 19. So this is gonna be congruent to negative 19 modulo P. But this means that P divides Q minus 19 using the definition of congruence mod P. But now let's reduce this thing modulo Q and see what we get out of that. So over here, the left hand side will reduce to P. So we'll have P is congruent to 19 modulo Q. But that means that Q divides P plus 19. Okay, but now from here, we're gonna multiply these two divisibility conditions and we'll get P times Q divides, well, that product right there. But I'll just take the product and we'll see that we get PQ minus 19P plus 19Q minus 19 squared. But notice that PQ already divides PQ, so we might as well get that out of there. And then we'll also like maybe cancel a minus sign and we'll see that this implies that PQ divides, let's maybe write it as 19 times P minus Q plus 19. Okay, great. But now let's cover one of the like cases real quick. Notice that if P 
times q divides 19, then that means that p equals 19 or q equals 19. That's because p is a prime, q is a prime, and 19 is a prime. But now let's plug this p equals 19 into the, this divisibility condition, and we'll see that that means that q divides 2 times 19. But q is not prime, which means q has to divide 19, but that means that q is 19. But if p is 19 and q is 19, well, that clearly gives us no solution because we get a lot of like cancellation in here. So that doesn't give us anything. Now let's go to the case where q equals 19. Well, putting that up here, we'll see that that means that 19 divides p plus 19, which means 19 divides p, which means p equals 19. But that is also a problem because, again, we cannot have equal values here. So that means that p times q can't divide 19, but if it can't divide this chunk, and 19 is a prime, that means it has to divide all of this. So that leads us to say that P times Q must divide P minus Q plus 19. Okay, but what does that tell us? That tells us that P times Q is less than or equal to the absolute value of P minus Q plus 19. We need an absolute value there because we don't know if this is positive or negative, just depending on the size of Q um, with respect to everything else. And again, like divisibility among positive numbers will definitely give you like an inequality relationship, which is what we're seeing right here. But now we can apply the triangle inequality to this, and we'll see that this is strictly less than P plus Q plus 19. Okay, so P times Q is strictly less than P plus Q plus 19, but notice that that leads us to P times Q minus P minus Q is strictly less than 19. But now let's add one to each side, and notice adding one to each side allows us to factor the left-hand side and it factors as p minus 1 times q minus 1 is strictly less than 19 plus 1, which is 20. Now, let's see where that takes us. Okay, so this case when p and q were bigger than or equal to 3 led us to p minus 1 times q minus 1 is less than 20. But notice if p and q are both bigger than or equal to 3, then that means that p minus one and q minus one are both bigger than or equal to two. So let's put that in here. So we've got p minus one and q minus one are bigger than or equal to two. But let's see, that kind of gives us a bound on the size of the other one. Meaning, this is going to restrict us to only finitely many values of P and Q, and a fairly small number that we could check. So let's maybe start with P is equal to 3. So notice if P is 3, then P minus 1 is 2, which means Q minus 1 is less than 10. So that means Q comes from the set 3, 5, and 7 because those are the only primes uh, between one and 10 that are not even. And then, well, we need to check if those work, but before we do that, let's maybe populate the rest of our possibilities. Now, let's move on to the case when P is equal to five. Okay, so that means P minus one is four, divide that over, and you'll have Q minus one is less than five, which tells us that Q has to be equal to three. Okay, so there's another possibility. Now, what happens if P is equal to seven? So notice if P is equal to seven, then P minus one is equal to six, dividing that over, and we'll see that Q is equal to three is the only possibility there as well. But then looking back at this, notice that P and Q cannot be the same. So that means I might as well get rid of this Q equals three possibility, which means Q is only five or seven in those cases. 
So now the name of the game is just to look at all of these cases individually. So let's maybe look at one of them. Let's look at P equals three and Q equals five. So plugging that into our equation, we'll have three to the five minus five to the three equals, well, three times five squared, which is 75 minus 19. Well, let's see, 75 minus 20 is 55, plus one is 56. So we have this is 56, and then this is 243, that's three to the five, minus 125, that's five cubed. But you know, that's clearly not true. So that eliminates the possibility that Q is equal to five in this case. And then you would just go like, one at a time from there and see that all of them will not give you a solution, meaning that our first two solutions were our only solutions. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.